Mark it. Thank you. Okay, sounds rolling, cameras rolling. We're ready to go. Okay, thank you. All right, Stuart, so uh, tell us about the first time that you heard about the US Festival, um, headlining the US Festival, and, and uh, how it all came about for you. I think backstage, somebody comes in with a wild idea. I think it was Miles. Would certainly have been Miles who brought it to us, the idea of this huge festival that's being created. And the sexiest thing about the festival, the thing that really got our attention is they're building an off-ramp on the freeway just for this festival. That's how big a deal it is for California. The state of California is building an off-ramp. That's a pretty big deal. What's amazing about that is Dr. Peter Ellis, who was one of the founding members of Unison, told me that Still to this day, people call from all around the country to find out how you actually get an off-ramp built like that <laughs> yeah. outside of a government agency. Yeah. So that, that was an amazing thing that, that Wozniak did. We also heard that there were all kinds of brand new techniques of, audio, of, of uh, maintenance of order amongst large groups of people. Uh, hydration systems for the audience, right? They're gonna spray the audience, you know, with hydration. We're gonna hydrate the audience. These, all these new techniques of, so that it would be the opposite of Woodstock, where instead of it being a, a disaster, it would be a noble enterprise where everybody came out feeling better than, than they went in because they were hydrated, I guess, uh, and because the music was presented more efficiently because the bathrooms were just high-tech, closer, and it was gonna be, a great experience instead of a miserable experience. Right, well, at the time, uh, this was obviously Steve Wozniak who just had loads of money from his Apple stock going to $280 million overnight, and he decided to throw this big festival. D did you have any idea of this uh, concept of Unite Us in Song? I mean, did you feel that at the festival? And, you know, did you uh, have any idea about Apple Computer, what their products were about, and what Wozniak was about? There was a rumor backstage that there was some higher motive, some unite us all in song thing going on. None of us had the foggiest idea of what that was all about. We were just backstage enjoying each other's company, as you do at festivals. And this was a particularly big festival with a particularly good roster of bands. And so I can't say that we really were championing the cause of joining in music or anything uh, uh, of that nature. but we. Sure had a great time joining with each other and hanging out at each other's caravans. Well, ironically, the, the Ghost in the Machine album had that red pictograph kind of computer yeah. technology look to it, uh, which I, I think people thought was 666 or something. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, there were a few, yeah. Right, people that kind of drew that. Uh, people who are looking for sixes. Right, looking for sixes and some kind of deep meaning. But uh, was the band itself like into computers? Were you guys like, uh, you know, it was kind of the computer revolution where you had the DX7s now and that kind of computerized sounds or were you guys pretty organic musically? Uh, music a few years after the US Festival took over music in a really deeply, profoundly way. T today, 30 years later, uh, music is in the realm of computers. Whoever would have thought that computers and music, of all things, this mystical, beautiful thing that is so undefinable is so computerable. Um, almost all of our music that you hear today has passed through a computer, either in its creation or even in its performance. In fact, large, uh, all the music you listen to in it, that we actually physically as primates dance to is generated by a computer. In the dance clubs, in the raves, they're not dancing to human making music, they're dancing to computers making music. Sure, humans programmed it, there's the human something in there, but the actual rhythm, the actual mechanical force of the thing called music that they are dancing to derives from a computer, was, was conceived on a computer, executed by a computer. Well, supposedly this ideal that Wozniak and Bill Graham and, and Dr. Peter Ellis, who were the three kind of generals of this massive festival, this United in Song concept was supposedly going from the, the me generation of the 70s to the us generation, which was you know this, this idyllic uh, proposition of people helping each other, people sharing things, you know, kind of a global... I thought the me generation was the 90s. Gecko. I guess that was Wall Street. Uh, the I don't know, I forget which generation was the me generation, but I guess the 70s are pretty me-ish as well. Yeah, the 70s are kind of me-ish with the, you know, 
into themselves. Now we're in the you generation. Correct. Or the I generation, right? The, uh, no, the, the you bastard generation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so they, they, they wanted to create this kind of Woodstock environment and, uh, and, and vibe. And uh, d did you guys hang out with other musicians at the festival? I mean, was there this kind of communal, like, wood, you know, Woodstock obviously was such a, a magical moment in time in music. Uh, would you say that this festival rose to the level of being something that was a, a cultural event for the 80s, per se, that Woodstock of the 80s? We were all celebrating backstage that this was not Woodstock. Um, and we were sold on the idea of all coming to this festival on that this would be the opposite of Woodstock. This is not going to be a misery. This is going to be a high-tech, sort of like Coachella is today. Right. It's absolutely comfortable. The grass is clean. The sound system is pristine. The, you know, just, it's a really great experience. And the US Festival was really the precursor to that, the idea that a festival isn't misery. So to the extent that it was the opposite of Woodstock was the extent that we had a great time backstage. Um, just everything was kind of closer and easier. And the systems, you know, because we'd all seen the Woodstock movie, which, loved the movie, glad I wasn't there. So, talking about the sound systems and all that, you know, Wozniak went out of his way to spend a lot of money on state-of-the-art sound. The stage was the biggest stage of its time. Uh, you know, it was 300 feet wide by 60, almost 70 feet high. And it had the big diamond vision screens. Tell me a little bit about, you know, actually playing and performing on that stage versus other venues and, and, you know, flying in in a helicopter and seeing this huge, massive venue and what he created there, I mean, as it related to the performance. Well, we were all excited about the special off-ramps on the freeway for this huge event, but we got there in uh, helicopters um, because we were just coming out of Los Angeles. And so we fly in and we can see, and it's early afternoon, it hadn't even really filled up yet, but it was pretty huge the audience already and so you know as we circled around and came around and landed backstage i've actually got the shot of my super eight uh of that crowd there we, we land and uh it was i think just the end of oingo boingo's set and uh, i ran up to the stage and shot their crew breaking them down the next band up was the beat who went out and they kicked ass and there was a you know and oingo, boingos are backstage now every band that comes off stage party in their place the bands who haven't been on yet not a party in their place. They're still kind of pre-gig. So one by one, you know, the, the, the Boingos are rocking. You know, the beat finish up. Their place is rocking, you know. And uh, B-52s go out. They burned down the, it was their day. It has to be said, the B-52s owned that day of the US Festival. And uh, they come off, the, 52, the 52s are rocking. And as the last act, you don't get the party. When you, when you come off as the last act, you get backstage, okay, now the police dressing room is empty. Everybody's gone, everybody beat the traffic. So the cool thing to do at a big uh, festival like that is have some other sucker close the show. <laughs> well, speaking of the show, uh, obviously you're playing in front of 250,000 people that day at Chris. It's the seminal event of the US Festival. There's all these people showed up. They were expecting, I think they planned for 100,000 people, so it was massive. How many was it? The first day was uh, uh, over 250,000 people. Hmm. And so you look up. That's, the, that's the number that I remember, I think. Do you, uh, that doesn't mean would, it's... Was that the biggest show that the band ever played? I mean, oh, yeah. Was... One of the biggest show ever, I think. Uh, had there been a Stones show in Florida of 500,000 or something like that, there were, I can't remember that we had the accolade on the day of it being the biggest show ever we would have remembered that. I, I think it is the biggest show. It's still Okay, the we'll take it. It was the biggest show ever. And, and so you, you played the biggest show ever. Would you say it's your best performance ever? I mean, did it, did it ignite the band to go beyond uh, the, even the limits of what you did typically live? Like all the bands on that show, we were mid-tour. We were already touring. We were already whip-cracking hot. Uh, you, you know, when you're on tour, your act is just is very solid. And um, when we hit that show, we were really in our stride. And although it was a really long day, longer than usual for us, of uh, waiting for the other bands and seeing the parties break out in their dressing rooms, uh, we played a pretty good show that night, I think. 
you know, the audience was a really big audience, which doesn't sound louder when you get outside. An arena actually sounds bigger than a stadium, paradoxically, um, because the enclosed sound makes it louder. Um, but you know they're there, and you can feel them. Well, this was actually the first show, I believe, in festival history where they put speakers out in the... In, in the yeah, with the, with the, uh, there was talk of the... Uh, there was talk of the delayed speaker system where the people in the back would hear the music at the same time as the people in the front. And I, I never uh, was out there at that time, so I don't know if it worked or not. You, you never went out in the crowd or out on the... No, well, I couldn't in those days. I had blonde yeah, I hair and, you know... Yeah, mauled and torn to shreds. Well, I did try uh, a dark, curly, gothic rocker wig. And the first thing was, Stuart, what are you doing with that wig? Okay, we'll kind of switch gears a little bit. We'll talk about Bill Graham. You know, Bill Graham was an integral part of creating this festival, and, and there's all kinds of lore about his contribution or taking too much credit for the festival and, and uh, you know, his kind of megalomania. I guess he just came off a Rolling Stones tour in Europe. Hmm. It was a bit edgy as it was. Did you know Bill Graham well and uh, work with him uh, quite a bit? Or? Well, my first brush with Bill Graham was when I was in college at Berkeley. UC Berkeley, and I had a little magazine that I had started up called College Event. And what I did is I took letters from all the college promoters, and uh, long story short, I had a little magazine. And um, the talk of these college promoters was bad Bill Graham, mean big guy. Uh, and so I was going to go on a crusade to expose Bill Graham, and I was like the young journalist with my magazine, and we were, we were going to bust Bill Graham. Boy, did I get unpopular real quick and suddenly phone calls stopped being returned and the world shriveled up um, and right at about that point I went and joined a rock and roll band and uh, the rest of my life uh, took a different turn um, years later not that many years later I'm in business with Bill Graham with Bill Graham uh, thankful for all of his strong arm techniques and mastery and domination of Bay Area entertainment he was a good friend of my brother Ian too. Right, I was that ask, helped. I was going to ask that because obviously they were, uh, you know, counterparts in the business. Were, were, were Ian and uh, and Miles at the show? I mean, were they involved in any of the setup? I mean, they were involved with the band, correct? Ian time? and Miles were both at that show. Yeah. <coughs> Ian, actually, I'm not so sure. He might have been in New York. I'm sure he would have flown out for that show. They were all his bands: Beat, Boingos, Fifty uh, Twos. I'm not sure about Talking Heads, but the Police. They were all his bands. Right. I mean, for the most part, that opening day was pretty much Miles Copeland, IRS Records. And that was IRS Day, yeah. Yeah. Except for uh, Talking Heads. And, and so uh, was Bill Graham, I mean, did you feel his presence at the festival? I mean, was he barking orders, yelling around, or was he pretty much... Uh, Never saw him. But it, but it, but it, but it, but it. Oh, just stop. Okay. 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 So, Miles didn't actually uh, book you guys there, or was he the one that set up the whole deal and he negotiated the deal? I'm the sure uh, the deal would have gone through Ian to Miles, um, and between them. So Miles set up the whole uh, festival for the police. He kind of negotiated the deals and negotiated with Bill Graham. Uh, I'm sure Bill Graham called Ian. Ian called Miles, and Miles and Ian would have figured out the deal. Supposedly, uh, all the bands got like the biggest payday ever. I don't know if you remember uh, anything about that, but they, I guess they were insistent on not having any bands play <coughs> any other venues in the immediate area, which is not typical, right? Um, do you remember this? I remember that stadiums would have exclusions. Um, if you play this stadium, you, can, you know, you can't play anywhere in that encatchment area. Not my problem. But you, you don't remember anything to the effect that they, Miles or Ian came to you and said, oh my God, we just got, you know, three times the fee for this festival. It's just amazing. Every show we played, we got three times the fee we got the show before. 
it was like that with the police, and it was still like that the day we stopped. And it was certainly like that when you guys came back in uh, your recent tour. You yeah, that, that, exactly, that, even more so. Still that recent tour probably, right? it, it, that recent tour probably grossed the same as all of our shows previous. So you guys didn't stay around for the festival uh, after you, you, you finished your show, you headed off, you were on. When we finished our, the show, there was no more festival. It was over backstage. Sure, there were people leaving, but we play our last, ah, blah, 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 thank you, everybody, thank you. Backstage, you could hear the sagebrush rolling across the empty fields. The abandoned caravans where once there had been laughter and song were now silent, empty. Well, I imagine people, they had been waiting for hours, right? They were camped out. They, they started the day early in the day. So they had had already about 12 hours worth of partying and fun yeah. and heat, right? It well, the band of, hadn't had any 12 hours of heat and fun. They were backstage having 12 hours air of air conditioning and booze. <laughs> they were, and by the time, you know, they wanted to beat the traffic. So the minute we, anywhere near the end of our set, they're out of there. And we'd also crisscrossed and toured and played shows with all that we've seen each other. You know, they, I'm sure they didn't, you know, wait, sit through our set. They've seen us a million times. So basically, 30 years later, we're now, uh, you know, so far away from the festival, but it's now uh, an anniversary coming up. And uh, it seems like this festival, for whatever reason, is, is a, one of a handful of festivals. You know, you could say Monterey Pop and Woodstock and maybe the California Jam, mm -hmm. but it's probably in the top five festivals of all time. I mean, would you agree with that assumption? I mean, just being somebody who played in it, that people still come up to you and talk about that event? The festival still res resonates. I mean, it ain't Woodstock. Um, I'm trying to give you an answer that you might actually be able to use here. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure that between you and me, it, um, you, well, the thing, the, actually, the, the, the way I see it, which is still not much use to your movie, is that it should have been, considering the talent the, you know, the, the really distilled creme de la creme de la creme that was at all those, you, you know, the different uh, versions of, of Us Festival, it should be up there with Woodstock. Um, and I can't think of anything else that has quite that pedigree. Well, for me, as, uh, you know, just somebody being on the outside, I was, uh, it was the MTV generation. You remember MTV right. was covering it. It was very, yeah. very uh, baby network, right? Yeah. You remember you had J.J. Jackson and Mark Goodman and all those guys covering. But to, to me, I just remember seeing it on MTV and kind of, I, you know, I'm back. How old were you at the time? I was uh, 22 years old. Right. I was playing in bands, but yeah. I remember watching it on MTV and thinking, what an amazing event. Yeah. I wish I could have been there. But uh, I, I just feel like it, it's something that uh, to have that many people, 250,000 people, you can imagine an audience and they're camping out there and to have it be peaceful and not have, you know, massive deaths, riots, and some of the things that happened where they implode. And hydration. And hydration for the fans. You know, I mean, who would think of bringing in a water <coughs> and spraying down the crowd because they were hot, mm. right? And, and giving people those kinds of comforts. I think Wozniak really kind of went out of his way to create something that that United in the song, maybe you didn't feel it at the time, it did kind of permeate through the thing and, and that it, it was the cultural event of the 80s for the mm. most part. Well, I think that the culture backstage notwithstanding, as far as Southern California's perception of the US Festival, it was very much this hands across the water, kind of a joining of us all, uh, the festival where all these people come together and nothing bad happens. Um, from outside the festival, that's what it was. Inside the festival, it was just a roaring great gig. Okay. Kevin, I just need a new we'll clip. We'll have about 10 more minutes or so. All right.